So in that case, we can move on to FaceNet. And FaceNet, you can use it to solve three different classes of problems in face recognition. One of them is face verification, which is what we just did. Is this the same person? Yes or no? The other one is face recognition. Who is this person? And the other one is clustering. You want to find similar people among the faces. This is an example. You can see that your data set in the real world or the images could have different lighting conditions, different clothing, different haircuts. These are the same people, but one of them is darker. The room, the other one, the room is brighter. There's a lot of clutter in the room. So this is not an easy task that you are solving. If I give you these numbers, you are going to say that a threshold of 1.1 can help you easily classify, are these two the same people or not? For instance, if your threshold is 1.1, this is less than 1.1, so these are the same. This is less than 1.1, these are the same people, these are the same. This is bigger than 1.1, so these are different people. So setting a threshold and coming up with these numbers is going to help you at least do the face verification. How are you going to do it? Let's keep this figure in mind. We are going to write down a new loss function to solve this problem. The loss function that we used in the previous slide was a softmax type of loss, which we are used to. This is a different type of loss. This is called triplet loss. And how does it work? You have an image. You take it. You push it through your convolutional neural network. You're going to end up with an embedding, a vector representation of that image. You're going to constrain that embedding to have a norm of one so that you're ending up on a sphere or a hypersphere. And this is the intuition behind this loss. What is that? The square distance between all of the faces, regardless of the image conditions, of the same identity should be small. So the same images of the same identity should have representations that are close to each other. And the other one, this is not enough, because if that's only the component that you care about, you're going to push all of your features together. So you're going to collapse into one single vector. What is the other one? The people or the images of the people who are different should have representations that are far away from each other. So that's the intuition. How would you do it? You're going to pick an anchor. And let's say this is this blue line here in your batch or your mini batch. This is the image of a person, of a specific person. You pick another image of the same person, perhaps under different lighting condition in your data set. This is your positive case. You're going to define a negative case, which could be any image of any other person in your data set. So the green line here is a positive case. The red line here is a negative case. Now you want the positive case to be close to your anchor. You want the negative case to be further away from the anchor. And this is called a triplet loss because you have a triplet here. What do you want? You want the distance in the representation space between images of the same person to be a smaller up to a margin than the distance between uh, two images of two different people. So that's what you want for all of your triplets. How do you achieve this? Through training, how can you achieve such a property? You're going to use a hinge loss. Whenever this constraint is violated, penalize. That's going to give you a cost function, a loss function. So whenever this is violated, whenever uh, this quantity plus alpha is bigger than the right-hand side, you need to penalize your parameters. You need to penalize your neural network. It's making a mistake. And that's going to give you a loss function. Otherwise, if this constraint is happily satisfied, this is going to be less than zero. This positive function is going to just set the value to be zero. So you're not penalizing anything. And that's your triplet loss. And intuitively speaking, visually speaking, initially before training, things could be like this. The negative image is closer to your anchor than the positive image. Throughout the learning, you're making the positive cases to be closer to your anchor and the negative cases to be further away. But triplet loss is going to have its own problems. Nothing is for free. It is beautiful, mathematically speaking, but once you implement this, you're going to run into troubles because if you keep showing these easy examples throughout the training, then your model is always learning from easy examples and then 
making them close to each other. And then it's going to take it for a long time to converge throughout training. And if you show it only hard examples, your model is going to collapse. So you have to balance the way that you're going to sample these triplets from your data. There is a question in the chat. So the anchor is the person we are trying to identify. In your data set, you are going to have a data that says, for this person, I have this image, this other image, and a lot of other images. For this other person, I have this image, this image, and another other, a lot of other images, and so on. Your anchor is going to be, for instance, this image. So you pick an image from your data set. You know the people who are the same or images of the same person. So this could be a positive case, and this could be a negative case. And that's going to give you a triplet of an anchor, positive, negative. And then you keep sampling from your data to create your batches. You want the representation of this image to be close to the anchor. You want the representation of this other image to be further away from the anchor. But then the next round of training, you might sample this person as your anchor, this other person as the negative, and this one as positive, and so on. This is the way that you're training your neural network. But this method uh, is either going to learn really slow or it's going to collapse. And I'm sure you guys have heard of curriculum learning. We didn't really need it when we were doing softmax type of losses. This is one of the places that you're going to need them. The question is, how are you going to select your triplets to learn better, faster? You can show hard examples or hard positives to your algorithm. You pick an anchor to select the corresponding positive. You are going to look at all of the images of this person and look for the one that is the hardest for your model to decide, which means that it has the furthest away distance. So your model is thinking that this person is not close or the representation of this image is not close to the anchor. You choose that one. So you're maximizing over the image. So now you're selecting your images. This is your positive case. How do you choose a negative case? Among all of the negatives, the ones that are closer to your anchor, your model is more likely to make a mistake on them. So this is a hard negative. This is a hard positive. And this is what you're going to use to sample from your data. So now your mini batches are not selected at random anymore, uniform yet random. Your mini batch is selected in a smart way. And this is called hard example mining. But if you keep showing an algorithm, always the hard examples, especially early in the learning process, it's like human being, it's gonna panic. It's gonna say that I'm gonna set my function to a constant, to a zero, I'm gonna collapse. And it's gonna stop learning. To avoid that problem, there is this idea of rather than finding the hardest negative, how about fi finding a semi-hard negative? And what do I mean by semi-hard? As long as it's relatively speaking to the distance between the representation of an anchor and a positive case, as long as your negative is bigger than the distance between your positive cases, then that's going to be a semi-hard negative. So you don't need to find the hardest, you're going to find the semi-negative. So as long as you, are, you manage to satisfy this, for a negative example, you're going to show that example to your training process. Any questions about this so far? Okay. So now, for instance, you can do your face verification. You can say that after all of this trouble, you're going to have a distance like what we just saw. How do you come up with your distance? For instance, you can take two images push them through your architecture, you're going to get two representations, compute their dot product, that's going to give you a number, and these are these numbers that you're putting here. For every pair of image, you're going to look at their representations, dot product, that's going to give you this number to work with. And then you can set your threshold. Now that you have an algorithm for face verification, the question is how do you evaluate it? So you're going to look at the distance, which could be the L2 distance, and if if it is above a threshold or below a threshold, they are either different or the same people. You are going to create a set of all of the pairs I and J in your data set that have the same identity. So this is going to be your, either your validation or test data. All of the pairs that have different identities, like this is a pair that have different identity, this is a pair that have the same identity. You are going to define true accepts. You are setting a threshold 
if the distance between two images is less than that threshold, you're coming to the conclusion that these are the same people. And if indeed they are the same people, according to your validation and test data, this is gonna be a true accept. But we know that this is a function of the threshold. If you change the threshold, you might come to different conclusions. Similar thing for false accepts. If two images, your algorithm decides that it's less than a threshold, then your algorithm is telling you that these two people are the same, but in reality, they were not. So this is a false accept. And then the plot that I showed in the previous slide is actually what you're plotting. It's false positive rate versus true positive rate. And according to your D, you're gonna get a curve. And that's how you're gonna evaluate your model. Actually, to be even more precise, you can take into account the sizes of your same and different sets, and then compare them relatively speaking. And the figure that I just showed you is these rates. These are validation rate and the false accept rate, and they are functions of your threshold. These are some of the mistakes that your algorithm is gonna make. For instance, it is thinking that these two people are the same. And to be honest, maybe a human being is gonna make the same mistake. Uh, similarly here, or even here. And the false reject ones, uh, look at this image. They are the same people, but these two images, even to the eye of a human being, might look really different. And um, we might decide that these are not the same people, despite the fact that they're the same. Any questions about FaceNet? So now you know when you go on Facebook and then it's gonna put a box around your face and it's gonna say, it's gonna tag your names in an automatic fashion, which Facebook stopped doing it recently. What is the ideas behind it? And how do they actually do it? The question is, does it matter what the deep architecture is? It matters, but uh, we know that whenever you want to push the state of the art, for instance, for face verification, you have multiple places to contribute. One of them is go ahead and collect more data. Go ahead and do a lot of data augmentation. Write a better loss function. Uh, use a better optimizer. Perhaps stochastic gradient descent is not the best one. Maybe use Adam, or maybe Adam is not a good optimizer. Use something else. Use a different scheduling for your learning rate. Uh, the architecture definitely matters, but we know that it's going to be convolutional in one form or another. We know that uh, for face verification, the details matter. The statistics around the eye are different from the statistics around our nose and mouth. So maybe having those local convolutions help. Uh, Coming up with better performance metric is another contribution that you can make. But here, what was important to me was the triplet loss because we have never seen it before. And that's why I went through this paper. So does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Any other ones?